As a miserable git, I feel it's my responsibility to keep things a little bit grounded in the land of sim racing. And Wired have just done a video called 2 million versus 63,000 luxury racing simulators. And uh, though it's great to see sim racing covered in more mainstream stuff, I think it's always good promotion. Uh, unfortunately, this video promotes the same tropes uh, and sort of misinformation that's uh, been kind of common in the last 10, 15 years of sim racing. It'd be nice if things moved forwards, but uh, alas, they have not. Now, uh, the filming of the video is nice and it does have some sexy people in the video. So it is positives. It has got some positives. <laughs> it's not all negative. As I say, it's all good promotion for sim racing. But I think from my jaded, miserable view, we can analyse the video and maybe at best it will help those of you that are also jaded to we can face palm in unity uh, at the parts of this. So uh, playing the video here, Wired Desired with Jeremy White. Um, the idea of this video is that they want to show super luxury goods. I'm not going to be able to have the audio on here and even showing this video in the corner like this, guys, is probably probably going to get me copyrighted, I think, because uh, I don't know. Anyway, the start of this video, we're shown off this uh, Pro Drive, which is their £63,000 simulator versus the £2 million simulator because they've gone for this contrasting of what's a cheap, <laughs> cheap luxury home simulator versus... Uh, what is a uh, 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 eat sleep mattress cover we're here to talk about sim racing not mattresses though this mattress does look pretty good let's skip the advert there um, yeah so they wanted to compare what is a cheap luxury solution with an expensive luxury solution now the problem with this already great for their production understand that but the problem is um, it's already setting up the idea that you have to spend £63,000 to get into sim racing. Like, if anything, if you were really approaching this uh, from a sort of genuine perspective of what, you know, what's the actual best thing you can have at home versus the best thing supposedly in a, in a sim centre, well, for like £6,000, you can build what, Formula One drivers use for their home simulators, like what Lando Norris, Verstappen, you know, a DD wheel on a T slot sim rig. And even you can have um like a an eight newton meter CSL DD, for example, or a Thrustmaster DD or whatever, you, or whatever, there's loads of them now. You could stick one of those on your desk with pedals and uh, for like a, a thousand pounds plus PC, let's say three thousand pounds, um, you can effectively get the 99 percent of what you'll ever get out of a simulator for for training as it would apply to real real life let's just say let's just say six thousand pounds categorically for six thousand pounds you could build a simulator which a real world formula one driver would be perfectly happy driving and from a racecraft perspective from a general training track learning all these things perspective uh would be absolutely uh fine uh <laughs> so Already we have like this weird uh, selection of choices, the, the 2 million or the 60,000. Also worth saying, these 60,000 pound sim rigs, or these, these sim rigs that you get that are these new design ones, there's a whole bunch of companies doing them. They always make the same mistake in that they'll have like nice curvy design, maybe like nice molded plastic carbon fiber, whatever, electric pedal position, whatever, nice stuff. And then they slap a monitor on them, which completely breaks the flow of the design. So it's like it, it, it's it, it's actually really these rigs are a really good example of um, the kind of thinking that you get with this stuff, where you have you you have something like this, and then you break it. But they're going to you have to have the screen, so they ignore that that's broken the entire design of the whole thing. But anyone that's looking at this sensibly would go well, this design doesn't work with that monitor, so we can't do that. So you might say, well, it's a good VR rig, in which case you'd go, well, why Why do you need all this stuff for a VR rig? <laughs> so anyway, that's just an interesting aside. Um, let's just pop back a bit here. And uh, they mention in the video... Like Jan 
who trained on Gran Turismo, have now broken into the pro racing world for real. Right, so the problem with that is Jan Mardinborough was also a really good go-kart driver and did go-karting. And the reason he broke into real life is largely because he'd done a lot of go-karting and also managed to win GT Academy. But if you'd followed GT Academy early on, the actual way that they chose the winner or the way that you won the final competition, it's a bit of a media thing. It's not, it's not like, oh, uh, you're the best sim racer and you've, you've won the GT3 raw skill and now you've got your skill and you've got into motorsport through, through that. It was more that Jan Mardibre, he's a really good, he had real world karting experience, amazing person. I've, I've met him, talked to him, really nice guy, great personality, perfect for media. Um, and then also he did do well in the GT Academy. He's have to do really well in it to be really good. But it's not the case that GT, that, that the Gran Turismo is what basically led to him getting a real drive the competition did but you know it, it's a sort of disingenuous presentation of these things where if you were a kid watching this this sort of stuff you'd be like oh if i play these i can drive a real car it's it's you know it's a little bit it's a little bit disingenuous uh, it depends how uh, cynical you are obviously i'm not cynical at all um so anyway uh yes it is the the general point they were making. You can use sims to get into real world driving, so that's fair enough. Maybe I'm being too harsh. You can go uh, at the moment. The iRacing F4 stuff I think is really good for people that are looking to get into real world motorsport. If you're especially a teenager, Race Room randomly does quite a few real world competitions and things that can lead to stuff. And if you look out for them, there are opportunities in sim racing. So the point the point stands. But if you again, it's worth saying. Like even World's Fastest Gamer. Um, competitions or all, all those like i go for i go fraga um i think even james baldwin uh they've all do go-karting and, and it's quite expensive to do go-karting in the first place so you know it, it's not quite as clear-cut but you can use sims to get into motorsport it's probably the, it is the only viable way for people that aren't millionaires let's be honest right, right let's go and continuing on with this so you've got the two sim rigs you've got oh he's playing ac he's playing highlands they're playing Highlands Long in the BMW E30 Drift. <laughs> uh, fair enough. Good choice of sim, though, Assetto Corsa. So you've got the £63,000 luxury racing simulator, though, ironically, it'll just be a DD wheel and pedals, so it's no more luxury than what you'd have on a T-slot sim rig. It's visually luxury. And then you've got there. Let's go to their next bit. I'm skipping through this, guys. Because I don't, you can watch this video in full. I just want to comment on the interesting parts, um, and I don't want to get copyrighted. Probably will do. You know how the internet is. I think this is fair, fair use here because we're not, we're not watching the whole thing. Um, it's actually nicely produced, though, as you'd expect from Wired. This is, this is a nicely produced video, nicely, um, nicely shot and uh, edited and kept snappy. So it's always difficult if you're producing this type of content for, I, I think this is straight to internet, but if you're doing stuff for TV or these types of things, um, it's hard to produce that type of content and keep it snappy and keep it interesting, you know. Uh, a lot harder than when you're doing your average YouTube video. Um, right, so they've got this chart here, price, design, innovation, and in the middle is wired luxury. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you can make a diagram to say anything. Uh, um, the law of diminishing returns. Yeah, so look, the, the quality decreases as you spend more. Wilkins speakers, okay, okay, you know, you get, you have to spend more to get that small bit of extra quality. This is fine, but right. So the the thing with this is, it's weird, right? So they do this with their, they think that Pro Drive is here and, and to be fair they have actually put the pro drive quite high up on their graph um and the the pro sim which is two million is only a little bit higher but it's all the way over here for more more cost that's fair enough on the graph i think that's pretty fair that you you get with a dd wheel and some nice pedals you actually do get very close to what what a top top thing would be um though the value of really high-end simulators right is not actually the motion platform and the big screen and everything. The value of um, these platforms is more the the fact that it's in a uh, studio 
uh, it could be set up to a hyper specific real world car you've got all the expertise in one place and you can dial and tweet things in very quickly and also it's normally you can get the data out of them a lot easier you know it's all set up it's like it's like having an office in an office <laughs> as opposed to having a office in your in your in your own uh you know if you've got space and you've got other people working there that come that has a utility to it and that but that costs a lot of money to have a specific simulator space as opposed to a um just a home simulator the latency the delay in inputs for one two and i want to know what that's like so here we go so here we go innovation is the latency the delay in inputs for using the racing simulator they've managed to get their racing sim down to four milliseconds Mo right so they make the claim in this video that latency is the biggest component of what's important now and he says they've got the delay down to four milliseconds now i'm not quite sure he's not specified where this latency has got down to four milliseconds which is a bit of a problem because it could be four milliseconds in the projector screens it could be in the motion actuators and the initial impulse it could be in the steering uh, you know it but at the end of the day well first of all that degree so most of the time they're 50 milliseconds or so. right most of the time simulators are 50 or 60 milliseconds delay well I'm not quite sure where they're getting that from. Like in reality, so on the PC side, if you've got stuff going through a USB stack, there's there's a number of delays, a millisecond of delays as you go, um, as you have the information sent to your USB devices. On a, if you're playing a sixty at sixty hertz on a TV with VSync on, um, that will have what like uh, thirty milliseconds added to it plus whatever. So you know, you'll you'll there will be inherent delay there, but. I, I can guarantee you on a home simulator with like an, a normal DD wheel with a 120 hertz monitor, the delay that you get from the visual delay and the delay of the USB and everything is utterly irrelevant in the time frames of ha what's important for a, for a racing simulator. Like driving a car is actually quite a slow thing. Like uh, you might be doing a snap over steer, the car might be moving quickly through the environment. But compared to like a Counter Strike, where you're snap aiming and you're having to hit pixels, um, driving is just not on the same level as that. Um, so you, f from a pure input perspective, a lot of driving is about predicting. Like the the player is predicting stuff that's happening over quite a long period of time, and it's not about fast reactions. Um, even if you're driving um, fat uh, Formula One cars, the car in front you know if it darts left and right it's still limited by what it can do on the track and then you make your decision based off you know what's going on you're you're not like it's not super super quick it's, it is reasonably quick but it's as i said it's not uh like as quick as a first person shooter in terms of reacting to an initial stimulus so granted lowering delay is always going to be a good thing to do but it's not really the be all and end all once you've passed a certain point and as i say home simulators are past that certain point by far now if they're just talking about the motion actuation um again like yeah you might you might high frequency vibrations and uh, bumps and things you want low uh, low uh, latency so the track texture and stuff's all represented properly by the uh, by the by the motion simulator which c can be really useful in many ways but stuff like left and right traction loss and um, more smooth sort of undulations actually all happen quite slowly. Again, you want to have you want to have as low a latency as possible. But guaranteed, if you've got like a a, um, a decent like D box solution or many of the other four point actuator solutions, they actually capture the road surface to a very high fidelity. I've been in a real world Radical SR3, an Aerial Atom, Toyota Celica, and uh, the four point actuator systems that I've used, Cubic Systems, uh, D-Box SA, line up to the suspension response of those real world cars very closely. Uh, traction loss and rotation, though, um, are something that happen quite slowly. And a big problem with traction loss and the slow kind of movements that you might want to do with a motion rig um separate to latency is that you then have to reset the motion rig every time you move it and they're sloppy and they don't really line up properly anyway 
so anyway, the point is, this 50 to 60 milliseconds, um, it doesn't make, it's, there's no, unless you like specifically contextualize it, it doesn't m mean anything. <laughs> So, and that's brilliant. <laughs> 50 to 60 milliseconds, and that's brilliant. Oh, I could make a cup of tea in about 12 seconds. That's brilliant. Oh, I've gone out of focus here, guys. Sorry. My ranting. My, oh, now, we've gone, now we've gone all dreamy. My ranting's just too good for... I oh, will leave it dreamy vision. That's because I had cream on my hands. Oh, dear. Thing costs up to 12 million. Right, okay. Why is it up to 12 million? So it was 2 million before. Uh, yeah, so one day you'll get something like this for your home, he says. Well, you can just get a D-Box or Cubic or uh, Sigma Integrale DK2 system for your home and it will capture the bulk of what this offers already. And and you can do that for cheaper than the £63,000 motion rig that they showed earlier. So, it... Uh, it's... Uh, you know what I mean? It's like, this is the thing. It's this sort of... They're not lying, but it's missing the point and not presenting information, which is what makes it... Um, that's the sort of crux of how these things always go. ...to why this is so realistic. This is the rig that allows it to move around. Then you've got the struts. I shouldn't be able to do this on a normal simulator rig, but because it's so low, low friction, look, I can... I can right. He shouldn't be able to do that on a normal simulator because it's low friction, he can move it. That's a completely arbitrary test that doesn't really mean anything. It, it, it means, okay, yeah, there could be low friction, but it could also depend on the geometry of how the this uh, motion rig is set up or if the motors are powered up in a certain way with damper on them or if it's completely turned off or that, that being able to move it doesn't, necessarily mean that's a good thing it doesn't mean it's a bad thing like i can i, I can understand where i can understand that he's saying you know there's there's low there's low mechanical friction inherent to the mechanics of it which is fair enough that's a reasonable argument to make but it, it's not really the be all and end all it's nice because it means you get a nice visual shot and some like nugget of information to show with someone pushing something to show the sim rig so from a creative point of view um I understand that. That's fair enough, but it really doesn't mean anything again without any more context or information behind it. Sorry that I'm out of focus here, guys. My camera is not going to focus on me. Um, I tell you what, I'll, fi I'll fix it. I I'm professional. Here's me commenting on commenting on this these guys' video again. I think that's really nicely filmed. Their their uh, thing. It's nicely filmed. There we go. I'll force. Logitech to sort itself out. There we go. Um, yeah. Right. Let's continue. Let's continue on uh, with Dynasma. Shift this on my own. That's how low the friction is on this. And then you've got the carbon fiber tub, an F4 tub. And the pedals that you reach through to around here are actually your lower body in the seat. So right. So uh, really nice. Nice having a cockpit of a car. Uh, F4 tub. Who doesn't like F4? As you guys know, in iRacing, F4 is the cleanest, most sensible, and most well-moderated race series that you can take part in. So it makes sense. Uh, you know, F in reality, F4 is is kind of taken over. Loads of people are going from. I think F4 started in 2014, and now it's basically like the start point for people that want to get into like F2 and then F1. Um, even more so uh it's one of, the, one of the few parts of motorsport where i mean it's still bloody expensive i think you're talking about 150 250 000 for a season or something still crazy expensive but the f4 chassis and the general because it's become sort of ubiquitous it actually has made it more affordable still ridiculous but it's one of the few parts of motorsport contrary to like gt3 and gt4 and everything where the prices just keep keep going crazy um f fours moderately in the context of motorsport has actually worked out reasonably well that's about it for motorsport it's still crazy expensive though probably still got more expensive but uh you don't have to be a billionaire to do f4 wrap around screens that's really nice to be to, to be honest those those uh wrap around screens are really good the main reason why uh wrap around screen is awesome um 
as, as opposed to VR, is obviously if you've got the space, uh, you might as well have a wraparound screen um, because everyone in the room can see what's going on. It does actually give you a wider field of view than a VR headset would. And it's obviously you can then put different helmets on or you can fiddle around with the simulator and what have you. And uh, it's from a... From a um, logistical perspective also if you're replacing the cockpit you're using on the motion platform all that stuff uh large wraparound screen i still think is like a really really um awesome solution though i have used setups like this you don't get 3d in what well, you can do but you then have to use like special glasses and then this projects have to be set up in a special way and it ends up being convoluted and in many ways worse than vr still uh but yeah you don't get 3d you don't quite get the depth the general depth uh, aspect but that de depth aspect is offset by the fact that when you're sat in a physical cockpit, that's obviously all 3D to you. And uh, it, in reality, you, the three-dimensionality of stuff or stereo is most noticeable with things that are close to you. And you'll notice that that projector screen is set quite far away. Uh, therefore, it still feels like it's 3D, even though depth perception won't be quite right. It still kind of feels a bit 3D because you've got the cockpit there and the screen's far enough away that you start to lose uh stereo and you, you tend to rely more on parallax when things are further away but uh yeah widescreen stuff's really awesome so that stuff i've just said there probably a bit too long and convoluted for a video like this but i think that kind of thing is really really interesting uh but uh you know whatever <laughs> right oh my word oh okay i like how this this red light on his face here <laughs> <laughs> the expressions he's making. Um, Come on. Oh. I don't want to get copyright. Here we go. It's this red light. <laughs> it's like it's like a nineteen seventies uh, science fiction film where he's having his brain sucked out by like a a machine, but they don't they don't have a budget to show any kind of animatronic machine or anything, so they just show a close up of the actor's face with a red light flashing on them, like that. If you watch Red Dwarf, like the the sucker that goes onto the face and takes the personality away from them. Oh dear. Right, so uh, I don't want to get music it to it. Feel like you're, you're there. Feels like you're there. So, so does VR though, right? VR, I, I have used simulators similar to this. Honestly, VR feels more like you're there than any simulator like this because um, with stuff like this, you're always aware that you're in a room and the motion always feels off and you are looking at a screen and you can tell it's a projector screen. It's nice, and I think initially, if, you, if you've if not used a lot of simulators, it's it's really overwhelming in some ways, like if you jump in a, a real car for the first time, it's really overwhelming. But after about an hour of this, you just get used to it, and you'll be like, oh, okay, just give me the basic simulator. But it looks like a really nice, I say, a wraparound screen is awesome, really great, uh, nice Monaco model. I can't tell what simulator they're using. Um, here we go, you've got a screenshot here, it's really hard to tell what sim they're actually using. Um, can't really tell from the graphics engine, and I, I can't tell from the physics, can't tell from any of the HUD. A lot of these places use R Factor Pro, which is basically just a licensed version of R Factor 1, but they often replace components of it. The physics are replaced, the graphics engine can be replaced. The R Factor Pro is just like an initial framework. It's like if you imagine a, a, an initial game engine that you've licensed, like imagine Unreal Engine can be used for first person shooters or it can be used for like ACC. Um, you know, that's just the game The game engine is licensed. There's initial tools that are licensed. So R Factor Pro isn't R Factor or R Factor 2. It's just a. Uh, 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 a game engine that a lot of, that a lot of teams have licensed in the past. Less so now, but it was more common in the past. Um, but this doesn't look like it's R Factor Pro to me. Um, so uh, the lighting does look a bit R Factor Two y, actually. <laughs> Who knows? But uh, so he drives around. He's humbled. Uh, I think for someone that doesn't do much driving. These types of rigs will, you know, obviously it really does. It's really involving. Uh, would be an awesome experience to have. Um, but this is where the magic yeah, happens. Uh, it's like that. Yeah, you can feel the back end of the car going out. The acceleration is absolutely phenomenal. Okay, so 
the acceleration is terrible. <laughs> Visually, it all looked good because of the widescreen, and that's be striking to people that haven't used widescreen stuff or even VR, widescreen VR. Um, but motion rigs, like every time they try to do um, surge forwards and backs motion, it's terrible. It's nothing like a real car. All you can see is this massive screen. But he's, he's referring to the screen. I have no idea how humans drive faster than that. Right, so here's, here's the beautiful part. Replace, replace, uh, re let's get a sexy guy. Here we go. George Boothby, pro sim racer. So this is really good that they got um, OG UK. Check out his channel, guys. Uh, really good. Nice streamer. Great guy. Uh, good looking. That's really important for sim racing. Uh, really good at Guitar Hero. That's probably the most important part for people that play iRacing and ACC. So that's good. Also helps for racing. <laughs> uh, so it's awesome that they got an actual decent sim racer to for this video. So big credit to Wired for that. Uh, so because obviously they figured you know you can have a presenter driving around like an idiot, but they're not going to be anywhere near the limit. Whereas someone like George will actually be able to drive uh quickly so uh the the thing to point out though is as someone that's done this as well not not wired but like if you're invited to try an awesome simulator uh by a company that's also going to be like they it's helping to promote you you know you're not gonna be the most critical are you also just for the people in the room even if you were like the most miserable, like I'm the most cynical, miserable, and I, I try to be really honest. I, I'll compromise looking like an ass just to be honest because it, to me it's more important because I'm, I'm stupid. But even if you are really cynical and you're, you're willing to like maybe upset people by being too honest, in this context, really, you're going to be like as anodyne and... Uh, <laughs> do you know do you know what i mean you're also going to be overwhelmed by the situation if you're filmed when you've been filmed by loads of stuff there's a whole production going on there's all this happening uh you know you, that primarily you're there to film content you're not there to enjoy driving the simulator and you probably don't get much time on it either at, at best a few hours um so it's a shame because uh it, it'd be really nice to actually get uh decent sim racers on this type of stuff uh for, for like hours and then have them unfiltered genuinely just be like it, no, totally unfiltered say what they do and don't like about it or and realistically go oh yeah i think i think i'll just have i think i'd rather just have my sim ring at home um but uh i think uh mr boothby did a did an awesome job uh so i can't i've got no complaints against him i think he also he taught really well uh, presented clearly so uh, can't complain about that but this is a very awkward situation this <laughs> right if you're sat right so for a start you probably can't hear them very clearly and then you have she's uh, I guess a, di a dynamic em employee um, just stood there she's not really in this conversation they're just having a, supposed to be a natural conversation uh but he'll have just, so the way this normally works he'll have just finished driving probably and um then they'll have, the director or the producer will have gone all right we want an immediate we want an immediate sort of response to catch you know so it feels natural so he's probably just like he'd been driving it and i guarantee it sim race will be like oh how does this feel why does this feel like that what do it trying to drive and then they'll be trying to get go faster and you know just play playing it as you do and he'll be in that mindset of driving and then it stops and then they'll be like, right, what do you think? What do you think? And he'll be like, oh, God, <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> um, he did a really good job. Uh, it's just very bizarre. Uh, it's like he's asking him, where did you hide the money, George? Where did you hide the money? Oh, I don't, I don't know. I don't know about any money. We know. We know that you know about the money. Look, it's just uh, it's a bit sinister. Um, you guys, you guys should watch this video yourselves. That's why I'm flicking through this. I know it's a bit annoying to watch this with me flicking through things and not really showing the video and the audio. As I say, I don't want to get copyrighted. Watch through the video yourselves. Um, of learning the track, learning the characteristics of a car, then even setting up the car. You know, you can trial it in the sim and then apply it to the real world. And I think that's where 
the market is and that's what's going to be a game changer right george you said the word game changer that is off to the gulags straight to the gulags G game changer <laughs> why do people keep saying it is a stupid saying uh but yeah he's right but but the thing is you can use a, a wheel on a desk, a G293 on a desk, and George knows this. He's, he's, I don't think George has been disingenuous to say he's presenting for this thing. Um, a wheel on a desk, pedals. You can learn the tracks. You can learn racecraft. You can really get into the essence of what it is to drive fast. Uh, and uh, that offers the, the vast bulk of what, what a simulator can really give you. The traction loss... On, and motion on this type of rig so the traction loss has a fundamental issue in that it can work quite well for slower vehicles but as you get to faster vehicles you really notice when you use these rigs the reset time because if it steps out one way the rig has to reset um and it has to reset in a way that's natural um or if you've got like a motion left or right to capture some form of g loading again the rig has to reset back to a central position and it always feels super off. To me, it always feels as if like the rear axle of the car has like detached. Whereas if you sat in a real race car, the everything feels very solid and connected all the time, uh, unless something's really physically wrong with the vehicle. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, if you just have a uh, well, let's let him talk here. Let's let him talk. That strike me about this simulator is that it is really is super realistic you really do feel like you're driving yes it's massively expensive but the value here is the money is all in that machine there so yes it costs millions but the experience is priceless really right so the thing the problem is though you can have as i say like a, a sigma integrale cubic d box four actuator system with a well set up DD wheel on a T slot sim rig at home, and from a functional, um, from an objective functional driving perspective, from the U, from the pre person's driving perspective, it will basically be the same as this m multi million pound simulator, like a, a, a five thousand pound, six thousand pound, ten thousand pound. Probably, you could for a three thousand pound simulator is effectively from a functional training utilitarian perspective can basically achieve the same from the driver's view as this two million pound sim simulator that that really is that's the problem with this video and this presentation in many ways now as i say the value of this type of simulator is more that it's in a sim center there's expertise around you you could have a consultant you can see the data everyone's in the same place it's like having an office that you can go to you can hyper set up this simulator to another real world car very specifically dial things in uh, you're still going to be limited by the software that they happen to use and the limitations of that specific sim software. Whereas on a home simulator, because things aren't as complex and necessarily set up, it can be the case that AMS1 or AC1 or R Factor 2 might actually have a better version of a car or a, a more quickly adaptable version of a car to get it closer to your real world car. Um, also, you might be able to use like Simucube Active pedals or some other pedals to actually dial it in quicker to your real world car in many scenarios. But putting that to one side, with this type of setup, the value is more that it's a sim center with expertise available and um, the, the, the sort of physical cockpit that you've got there is obviously big. It's hard to put that in, the, in, the, in your house realistically. Um, so wheel buttons and how you, if you're designing different types of steering wheels and how the buttons operate and what drivers tend to look at. Um, and you're testing like awareness where drivers tend to look and all the kind of, if you're doing like scientific research, Obviously, having a sim rig like this does have value and utility to it. And I think not normally every single type of simulator, flight driving, whatever, in different configurations, often you can find a specific utility or, or value from them. However, the way this is presented is that from a driver's perspective, like your average viewer watching this would go, oh, yeah, you really do. You really would need to spend two million pounds to get the ultimate sim racing experience. And I would say... If you were, if you're someone that's going to spend more than an hour a day playing a racing sim, driving a racing sim or training, you probably get better. It probably, be, it would actually quantitatively be better having a home simulator that's a six thousand pound home simulator on a T slot sim rig. 
If your goal was to be a faster race driver and get better results, maybe not for a team, maybe not for setting up a car and minimising cost for car setup, but from a driver training perspective, a home simulator that's more simple, I think you could very, you could argue would would objectively produce a better result. I don't think they're going to say that in this type of video. Um, well, no, copyrighted. So uh, yeah, nice, nice video though. That's hardly a surprise. But the difference between the Pro Drive and the Dynisma is that Pro Drive is going for aesthetic over all else, really. Yeah, so what they do. Dynisma is really trying to push the boundaries forward. They sim so, what they do, this is part of just uh, narrative storytelling for this type of video. It's going, wow, well, you know, this one's both positives because we can't have any critical negativity because that's, if you're critical and point out negatives of stuff, that's bad, ruins the mood, and uh, it's hard to make money from that. So, yeah, one of them's aesthetics and looks, even though it actually looks crap because the monitor completely breaks the, the aesthetics of it and it's huge, it takes up all your space in your house, so what on earth? Or it's a purely functional simulator with a giant screen um and uh two million ultimate trading tool most realistic thing you can have though actually in reality it probably isn't the most utilitarian thing you can have for actually being a faster driver so in both scenarios they got it completely wrong um but it had og uk in this video go and subscribe to him i'm glad he got to drive an expensive sim rig mr george boothby <laughs> so there are positives that come from this and it's nice that some people are being employed at a simulation centre. Uh, you know, they've got a job working with sims. I'm sure dialing in the servos and all the training and stuff and the, uh, you know, that's nice. So it, it depends how cynical you are and how objective and critical you are. Uh, but uh, fortunately, George, George didn't get this happening to him. That's the main thing. He would have had his soul taken away from him by the red light on the steering wheel. And you don't want that to happen. But uh, that's about it, guys. That's our investigation into this video. This was incredibly low effort, this production. Um, hopefully you enjoy it. You can subscribe to it. If you like this kind of meandering brain dump type video, let me know. Um, we'll see We'll see what happens with copyright. Uh, until, the, until the next one, guys, thanks for watching. Take care. And goodbye.